make you sweat, gonna make you move. Da 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 Wow, is it working? Like first first shot? This is amazing. Wow, that just popped right on. Great. Feeling good about it. Feeling good in the neighborhood. Applebee's. Is Applebee's gone? Are they all gone? What happened? Where are the chain restaurants of yesteryear? Because they were all on very shaky footing before COVID. I can't imagine many of them are still around unless they're going to get bailouts, which would be very funny if there was some sort of, like, Chili's bill where Chili's is all in capital letters. The Chili's bill, and it's all money for chain restaurants. Because, honestly, like, what are you going to do for people for whom going to those chain restaurants really is a social event? The closest thing they have to one, anyway. I mean, it's what replaced the Kiwanis Club and... uh and the Elks and, and, and VFW is going to fucking uh, Applebee's. Neighborhood Bar and Grill. That's what they call it. Uh, yeah, I know they got the PPP money, but I mean, I think they're going to need more. They're going to need even more if they want to uh, keep, keep, keep it going. Because even before uh, the collapse of... Uh, the retail sector and dining. They weren't doing great. 500 episodes. Can you believe it, folks? What a long, strange trip it's been. Gerald Garcia. Ah. It is indeed a very weird and disturbing universe we inhabit, isn't it? it certainly is. How the hell do we get five goddamn 100 episodes out of this thing? I have no idea. We'll see how many more we get. I hope it's a lot. 500 more. Why not? Just become a permanent fixture in the podcasting universe. Still be a podcast when they turn into brain implants, courtesy of Elon Musk. That'd be pretty fun, huh? Uh, okay. Uh... Getting up here. All right, so let's start talking about chapters three and four, or chapters four and five, rather, of Reconstruction by Eric Fodder. Uh, so the first, the fourth, the fourth chapter, uh, the about is about the re the attempt by Reconstruction authorities to impose a free labor standard uh, on the former South, which uh, had a lot of problems as you could imagine. Uh, and I want to start with a hilarious little uh, anecdote that Fawner finds in here that, so the b basic fundamental reality that all of this attempt to struck, create free uh, labor institutions in the South, like contracts and all that, all that was based on one fundamental fact, which was not assured to happen, which could have gone otherwise. This is why I fixate on uh, uh, the notion of contingency and the idea that the Reconstruction could have done, gone differently, is that all of this uh, that we're going to talk about these chapters is premised on the, uh, the wholesale pardoning, basically, of the f Confederate uh, elite, the, the slaveholding class, which is about 200,000 people, who uh, who br brought about the war for their own choice were responsible for the war uh, and were given a pass by Andrew Johnson. Were said, "Go back to your land. You get your land back. Uh, we'll even give you back your political rights if you sign a little thing saying that you're loyal or whatever. Uh, and then even if you, and if you made a lot of money, even if you were one of the most elite, you can get a pardon uh, if you ask me nicely." Literally, they had a provision if you had more than $20,000 in property, you had to ask for a personal pardon from the president, which Johnson started handing out 
like uh, fucking hotcakes as soon as they started asking for them. So the, the upshot of all of this is that the slave, the ruling class gets to maintain or try to reassert anyway. Some of them had difficulty uh, when, when they found their uh, their plantations ruined and their their uh, their Confederate uh, bonds worthless, but a lot of them were able to maintain their land and maintain their influence. And a lot of them fixated on the idea of just going back to the way things used to be. Uh, and one of the ways they did that, according to Foner, was uh, by <laughs> going back and recreating the uh, the high chivalric feudal cosplay that characterized Southern society. Uh, Mark Twain, actually, when he wrote about the Confederacy, he had been a, uh, he was mustered into a Missouri Confederate unit early in the war and then quickly deserted. Uh, and then after the war was very critical of the Confederacy uh, and Southern society in general. And he blamed the war on Walter Scott. He said that, uh, that all of that uh, romantic feudal uh, uh, fantasy got into the heads of the planter elite and proving that the uh, claim that they were like the Bourbons after uh, the return, the fall of Napoleon uh, who were said to have come back having forgotten nothing and learned nothing which is why the reactionary Democrats uh, who took over uh, Southern, the Southern Party uh, after the war were called Bourbon Democrats uh, they were in, they were committed to trying to act like nothing had changed. Even though they just got their asses kicked and the entire country, their country, was burned to the ground. Uh, they staged chivalric tournaments. Tournaments straight out of Ivanhoe, complete with knights adorned with lances and plumed helmets and ladies competing to be crowned queen of love and beauty made an incongruous reappearance. Although in one... In one North Carolina community, the cult of medieval nobility waned after blacks organized a tournament association of their own. So here you see the, 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 conflict, the conflict that would define Reconstruction. A planter, or one of them anyway, a planter elite trying to reassert the old way of being with the fact of a free black population uh, uh, making it impossible. Or at least making it much more difficult than they would have liked. Because how special is it? How, is, how special is your fancy little tournament if, if, if your former slaves can run around and pretend to be galloping uh, dipshits the same way? So one of the big uh, impacts of the, uh, the abolition of slavery and uh, the abolition of the plantation model was the end of plantation paternalism. Uh, which was the, by any standard, it was the the uh, the one sort of saving grace of the plantation uh, slavery model, uh, economic model, relative to northern wage labor, which is that in the northern wage labor system, if you are not of economic use to capital, bye bye, you had you were not, no one was obliged to you in any way. And if you didn't have family who could take care of you, you were JWF, jolly well fucked. Uh, in whatever else you want to say about slavery, and it was, of course, monstrous beyond measure, uh, aged slaves, slaves who could no longer work in the, in the fields, were taken to be sort of the, uh, the, the, uh, the their um, maintenance, their, their, li their uh, sustenance was the responsibility of the slave owner. And... The slave owners thought, well, at the end of the war, well, if, 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 if there is no more, if there's no gratitude on the part of the slaves, which they insanely thought there should have been, uh, and there's no, um, and there is no obligation, then I have no obligation to uh, the slaves either. And so things that used to be part of a plantation uh, complement, like food and shelter, were charged for, and, uh, and slaves who couldn't work were not anybody's responsibility, but the markets. The pro and of course, for, uh, for Northerners, they might look at that and say, fine, that's great. 
fun, finally, free labor associations, not this quasi-feudal arrangement. But the thing is, is that the assumption underlying the free labor institutions of the North, which they were trying to impose on the South, was a civic equality where market transactions could take place in, which the, uh, the, the white Southern society was committed above all else to refusing to allow to occur. So that's another one of the conflicts that, uh, that the Northern authorities who were trying to administer reconstruction really kept finding baffling. They were trying to give people the chance to, to live as Americans as they did in the rest of the country. And these Southerners, they just refused to go along with it. And they just could not understand why. Uh, on, the, on the part of uh, freed slaves, there was a real uh, desire to access that yeoman vision of freedom. The, the vision, by the way, that was Lin Abraham Lincoln's presiding vision for American liberty. The idea that because of the, because the idea that access to land allows the American citizen liberty from the market, liberty most importantly from the, uh, the compulsion of wage labor. Wage labor might be a station in life but in Lincoln's fantasy of how America was supposed to work and how it kind of did work in places like his Springfield in Illinois, uh, which is what, uh, which is the concept that Richard White begins his book with laying out Springfield and saying, this was Lincoln's vision for America. Uh, what that required was uh, self-sufficiency in land, access to land so that one could make, mo make money in the market, but also sustain themselves on the land meaning that they could save money, choose employers as they saw fit, not as the market dictated, and that they could save money to improve their the amount of land that they held. And that was something that many, many former slaves were dying to fucking try to access. But, uh, that, but one thing that stopped them was Johnson administration's refusal to redistribute land, the single biggest catastrophe of the Johnson uh, presidential reconstruction era, uh, and also the fact that for the former slave owners, the only social uh, value of the black population was as labor for them. The, the idea of uh, blacks being independent yeomen was totally anathema because that would imply that they were members of a community, members of a society, which was absolutely uh, a, not what they wanted. If they needed, if they were to exist, they were to exist for the benefit of owners, for the benefit of, of, of employers now instead of uh, masters. And this is a thing that Northerners kept running against and being baffled by. Uh, and it was funny. So, so many Northerners actually came to the South, bought land, tried to create their own plantations, motivated by the belief that, uh, that if you gave uh, uh, former slaves... And it's, uh, the market incentives that they would produce profits for you uh, through cotton cultivation. Uh, but it, over and over again, uh, the former slaves resisted being used as uh, profit making for someone else, which they knew instinctively it was the relationship uh, because they had only encountered it their entire life in, in favor of sustenance and in favor of working land for their own family's benefit not for the profit that they knew they would never see. Uh, and that became a big problem for a, a lot of Northerners. And for a lot of Northerners, it confirmed the uh, stereotypes that they had heard from former slave owners, that you, we have to, you have to have a system of compulsion of labor in place, or otherwise they won't work. The blacks won't work. And the fact was, they won't work for you at your... Um, on your dictates, which was enough to throw them into furor because they could not see any other social utility to the very existence of these people if they were not there to provide surplus for the ownership class. Which, uh, And a lot of those uh, Northerners were baffled because they thought, no, 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 things are different. Now it's different. Now, now we're, 
we're uh, collaborating. You're not, I'm not your master. I, I'm, I'm your employer. And they were baffled by the fact that, that former slaves didn't have that motivation to see their bank uh, balances expanded. And I, and that reason, a big reason for that is that free labor ideology that the North was trying to impose on the South was premised on a notion of civic equality that obscured the reality of class conflict. Because even in the North, with this fantasy, oh, everyone's on the same side, we're all building together, was a lie. But it was a lie that was allowed to be propagated and, and accepted by many people in a false consciousness because of things like um, civic equality. Because people were all considered to be within one uh, unit. If you had uh, if you had land, you could vote, but uh, uh, black suffrage was completely rejected by these early Reconstruction Southern governments, and so and black skin was was uh, socially prescribed from huge areas of of social intercourse, and so in a very real way, uh, black people, former slaves especially in the South, were demystified about they were they did not have the the uh inculcated illusions that the culture of of uh civic democracy in the north had allowed to spread and uh there was a very concerted effort among the freedmen's bureau uh and the specifically the uh educational institutions that they sponsored throughout the south for the former slaves to inculcate on, into the former slaves and their children uh the value the idea of uh, the, the idea that class con conflict could be elided and transcended through education and self-improvement, which was an endemic belief in the North, but that just could not be sustained in the face of the social reality of the South. And they were doing this, the, the, they were, the, the Freedmen's Bureau was frantically trying to get this message out there, in large part because... Uh, the people in charge of the Freedmen's Bureau, which was a revolutionary institution in that it was doing things that the United States government at the time was, saw essentially as anathema in any other context. The sort of direct provision of, of, of help, uh, of poor relief, was considered uh, offensive to free institutions at the time because of the, the pervasiveness of this free labor ideology. Uh, and so... The uh, Bureau was wildly underfunded, understaffed, and even the people who did staff it were largely interested, first and foremost, in reducing the need for, their, uh, for the institution to exist. They were trying to undermine their own remit as quickly as possible so that they could, uh, so that, that they could stop this transgression against free contracts and, fr and, and liberty uh, as quickly as possible. In very few people were willing to recognize that the reality of emancipation and the rea reality of this new class war in the South necessitated a changing relationship between governing institutions and the citizenry. But even the dis earnest desires of the Freedmen's Bureau to eliminate themselves were stymied not really so much by the former slaves who did, of course, come to the Freedmen's Bureau and saw it as really one of the only institutions that ha even could potentially uh, uh, give them justice since all local courts and, uh, and legal institutions were arrayed against them and were completely packed with bitter former Confederates. Uh, but it was the fucking former Confederates themselves. Uh, the, the Johnson and the Freedmen's Bureau gave the South back to their planter elite on a platter on the condition that they do something to try to uh, institute a free labor system in the South, and they fucking refused. They looked. They didn't only look a gift horse in the mouth. They pissed out in its teeth. And the one thing that the Freedmen's Bureau did that might have actually created a, a situation where, uh, where there would have been a basis for endure, the enduring establishment of black political power in the South, which was necessary because it was necessary to change conditions and to truly um, uh, fulfill the revolutionary implications of the Civil War because 
you know, the interests and passions of the North were always going to be short-lived relatively because of the lack of their personal investment in the outcome. Uh, it was going to be, it was going to be only through the uh, in, the intensification of black political uh, uh, power that would have asserted on the ground uh, uh, black equality. And the thing that could have done that was land was ownership of land. And the Freedmen's Bureau did actually, in the very immediate aftermath of the war, begin a program uh, of land redistribution. Not only was land that had been claimed by uh, sl uh, former slaves from abandoned uh, plantations and such codified as owned by them, but uh, land that had been given to slaves as a war exigency by Sherman, for example, marching through South Carolina, was ratified. And also, uh, General Oliver O. Howard uh, issued Circular 33, which, set, which was the ba one of the basis for the 40 acres and a mule notion that, that set aside or, or planned to set aside 40 acre tracts for freedmen to cultivate on their own. And if that had been followed through on and intensified, uh, you, that, I think, is really the chance for uh, Reconstruction to have taken a different turn and for American history to have taken a different turn. Uh, and Andrew Johnson, <laughs> motherfucker, uh, single-handedly and against all of the momentum that was happening on the ground in the South, uh, canceled all redistribution, ordered all slaves, uh, ex-slaves off of land that they had uh, taken or had been off uh, given, uh, fired and reassigned all uh, commanding officers in the Union Army who were committed to land redistribution, which was not none. There were several radical generals who were uh, committed to a project of land redistribution who were assigned or removed from, from power when they resisted uh, Johnson's order. And this really is, this is the, the, the bad turn. And I know a lot of people want to be cynical about Lincoln, and there's plenty of reason to be so. Uh, but I just honestly do not believe that Li and Abraham Lincoln would have done that. More than anything, because the notion of uh, freedom in America being the freedom to cultivate one's own land, in addition to access the market, was Lincoln's entire guiding principle. His political uh, hero was Henry Clay, and Johnson's was Andrew Jackson. And I don't think that you can say that going from one to the other in the middle of this incredible moment of ferment had no impact on anything. I ref it just doesn't make sense. They, now, you can say, well, it might have gotten, they, they, it might have been rolled back anyway, but the fact is there was no force in the South who could have made it go away at that time. The land was in the hand of the former slaves. They were tilling it. The Union Army was supporting their claims. Then the president said, stop it. The president said that. Not really under pressure from anybody else. Not part of any groundswell of support in Congress. As an individual decision, he decided to do that. So even if the pressures to break up uh, the redistributed land would have emerged, they would have emerged later in a atmosphere where the continued tenancy on that land would have would have built the power to resist it that's the thing that people forget when you, you when they talk about these things mechanic mechanistically well all these all the racism was still there these institutions are still there yeah but as soon but if the the reality on the ground is different then the uh incentives are different and the balance of power changes over time and I think a situation where uh, uh, ex-slave uh, access to land was not stopped, or would have it would have not only stayed where it was, it would have accelerated because it would have solved a lot of the problems of Reconstruction from the point of view of the Northern authorities. The persistent violence and and the the uh, the persistent need for Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, um, intervention to to provide food and supplies and and uh and uh legal aid for former slaves it would have reduced the workload they wanted to reduce the workload and blacks being able to sustain themselves on the land would have helped them do it 
But instead of that being allowed to ferment, it was stopped. And not just stopped. They were. It wasn't like they didn't just say no more. They sent the army out to pull people off the land. People who resisted. People who said no. That's not fair. We fucking cultivated this land. It's ours. And who believed that things might change with the new Congress. They were forcibly removed. And that to me is the... I don't see that happening in any context without Andrew Johnson being president. But I think it's, we need to point out again, uh, one of the most interesting things about, uh, about the contradictions that are built into Reconstruction. And one of them is, is that the fundamental liberal ideology of basically everybody from the North who went to reconstruct the South in the image of the North was that the interests of capital and labor are identical. They believed that. And like I said, it was the yeoman, fan, it was the yeoman land access that made that fantasy viable. The idea that, yes, you might have to work in a, in a factory, you might have to work for somebody else, but you can always get land and work it yourself too, which meant that you could choose the, uh, uh, the conditions of your employment because you could always just grow turnips. That was the fundamental thing. But it was still, even with that, a fiction because access to land is not equal, obviously. Access to materials are not equal. Luck is not evenly distributed. In fact, it tends to accrue to people who already have resources and land. But it was a fiction that was maintained by the reality of social mobility, which was real, uh, as well as the racial solidarity of the white North and the idea uh, at which, uh, honestly, more than anybody, uh, John C. Calhoun was the most perceptive about. His entire argument for slavery was, as long as there is a subject race, then all whites, regardless of their social position, will see themselves on the same side. And that will obviate the inherent class tensions that would otherwise emerge. Because Calhoun, uh, Hofstetter has, an, has had an article uh, about Calhoun called The Marks of the Master Class. Because he said that uh, Calhoun's analysis of class conflict was the same as Marx's. That it was the basis for society and that it was inevitable. But Calhoun said that Racialism, a racialized society, allows that class conflict among whites to be uh, obscured. And it did. Uh, and then let's not forget national identity, nationalism, the idea that you're an American, that you're part of an American project, that you have a vote, that you can involve yourself in the political process. These things obscure and mystify the reality of the, of the basic fact of class conflict. But a war between, and it really was a war, uh, over resources, over contracts, over conditions of work between ex-masters and ex-slaves was class war unmasked. Because the ex-slaves did not have access to any of those mystifying social relationships of nationalism, of racial solidarity, to obscure the reality of class conflict. And it was very much in the interest of the Freedmen's Bureau and everyone amongst the northern uh, elite to get away, find a way to get that mask on to remask that class conflict, which honestly is one of the factors that would have been most crucial in motivating genuine land redistribution. Because as I said, access to land was the sine qua non of yeoman freedom. And guys like Lincoln understood that more than anyone. And I want to end uh, the discussion of chapter four with a quote, a long quote from uh, the end of it. Uh, thus began the forging of a new class structure to replace the shattered world of slavery, an economic transformation that would culminate long after the end of Reconstruction in the consolidation of a rural proletariat composed of the descendants of the former slaves and white yeomen and of a new owning class of planters and merchants, itself subordinate to northern financiers and industrialists. Now, just to stop here to say... Uh, Eugene Genovese was, uh, in the 60s, was a Marxist historian who, who, who studied the culture of uh, plantation slavery. He wrote a book called Roll, Joel, Jordan, Roll, which was very influential in sort of uh, the cultural history of the antebellum South. 
Uh, and he turned into a neoconservative, like many did, after the failure of the 60s revolution, when he decided, I guess, that the Marxist nostrums, the Marxist teleology was a fantasy, and that capitalism was essentially inevitable. And when that happened, he looked back on his writings about the, the antebellum South and decided, you know what? This was superior. This was better than what came later. And honestly, if those are your two options, I don't think it's necessarily correct, but it's arguable. But the thing is, it was not inevitable. And this is what, uh, this is what Foner emphasizes here in this section. The historian, however, must avoid telescoping the actual course of events into a predetermined linear progress. Both planters and freedmen viewed labor relations as a shifting conflict on a terrain whose victories and defeats remained provisional, and trial and error altered each group's perceptions of its own self-interest. A new set of labor arrangements did not spring up overnight, and there was no preordained outcome to the workings of what a federal treasury agent, agent described as, quote, the new system of labor, if system it may be called, when there is endless confusion and absurd contradictions. So here you see, looking backward, this is all, the Civil War itself just looks like the war of, of uh, a victory for the, Northern, the Yankee Leviathan of finance capital. But it did not at any point have to be that. And I really do think that the killing of Lincoln helped, but was not the only thing, obviously, that helped shape us in the direction we went. And, uh, and so for the rest of that chapter, Foner talks about how there was this contest over conditions of work, over what a contract would look like, over how, uh, over how land would be cultivated. Uh, and at every point, uh, the ex-slaves, uh, they knew the power of group negotiations, like the, a plantation, uh, the, a, a former plantation workforce would organ would essentially, uh, would bargain with their former owners as a unit, would in fact sometimes have internal democratic discussions over what sort of contract to take and then, and then stick to it. This was like a proto-organized labor uh, among uh, the former slaves. And there were a bunch of different conditions that obtained, different contracts, uh, uh, different wage scales. Now, of course, the lack of hard currency and the ground meant that very little of the... Uh, of these very few of these newly freed slaves who were now supposed to be working for wages actually got wages because there was not very much money or credit to be had then they were given an agreement of a percentage of the sale of the cotton generally at the end of the season which of course was rife for abuse and and, um, and thievery and which the remedying of which was one of the main uh, roles that the Freedmen's Bureau had was to stand up for the interests of uh, the laborers in these negotiations. Uh, and there was actually a period at the beginning of Reconstruction when uh, the very high price of cotton uh, allow, and, and the huge shortage of labor because of the number of women and children who were pulled out of the workforce by into a domestic sphere, uh, and the increased mobility of slaves to move, of former slaves to move away from areas where there was a bad deal to areas where there was a good deal. It actually allowed for uh, some pretty good arrangements, which were backed up by the federal government, to be had and some actual money to be made. Uh, but of course, uh, there was then a series of catastrophically bad uh, harvests and then a collapse of global cotton prices, which sh severely reduced uh, the ex-slaves bargaining position and uh, changed their ability to uh, assert themselves. The other thing that really helped them, or that really hindered their ability to assert themselves uh, in the years after the war, uh, was every decision made by motherfucking Andrew Johnson. So let's turn now to chapter five, which is about, which we, we've gone now from the first uh, four chapters, which sort of are a social, uh, uh, a broad look at the social terrain of the former Confederacy, to um, a analysis of Andrew Johnson and his uh, choices, his administration's decisions during the first uh, years of the war. Uh, thanks to the amazingly uh, arcane uh, nature of American presidential and congressional elections, uh, there was a period after Lincoln's assassination when um, Johnson essentially governed 
completely by himself because Congress would not be coming back into session until December of 1966. Which meant he was in the early months of Reconstruction, most crucial months, mm, free to essentially do whatever he wanted, which is what is now called presidential Reconstruction. So let's start with a uh, portrait of Andrew Johnson, who is really a quintessence of all of the worst elements of American populism. He is in the grand tradition. As I said, his, uh, his political hero was Andrew Jackson. He is part of the grand tradition of, of, of the of the rough-hewn yeoman, uh, hostile to federal power and the prerogatives of, of banks and Eastern interests, but also because he was never, because he, unlike John, uh, Jackson, did not become a wealthy uh, uh, plantation owner himself, inveterately hostile to the interest of the local planter elite. And his status as a unionist was premised more than anything on a resentment of the fancy boys who ran Tennessee, who looked down on uh, upcountry uh, uh, poor people like Johnson, who had risen from being a, um, a tailor's apprentice to being a senator and a governor. He very much was a, 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 a sort of a dark mirror image of Abraham Lincoln. They were born very close to one another within the same year, uh, and they both came from poor backgrounds. They both worked themselves up into the ranks of politics. But where Lincoln's ambition was sort of fused to a humane understanding at some level, Johnson's was completely self-fixated. He his any his populism was entirely generated by personal resentment, and that is the under that's the problem with populism as it has been expressed in American history is that if you don't have a rational analysis of power, which you don't if you're just some fucking ice rube. Uh, and you don't have any kind of emotional connection to like a broadly construed underclass, which he did not. All you're generated by is, all your actions are truly generated, motivated by, is resentment. And resentment by itself is, it's dirty fuel. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to do the job. It is very much like Trump. There's a straight line, really, from Jackson to Johnson, <coughs> to Trump. I mean, you can throw Nixon in there too, but honestly, Nixon was much more humane and, well, I mean, not humane, my God, what he did in Vietnam, but he was more restrained, I guess, than the rest of them. But he was similarly motivated by just a burning, churning resentment of power, not really any desire to see power overthrown. And that, and that is where the resistance to global capitalism is coming from now is pure resentment based with no solidarity undermining it uh, or uh, undergirding it and no intellectual structural analysis of power that might overturn, you know, rude passions either. Because that's the important thing to remember. Forget about whether it made him a good or bad person. It made him a bad politician because Johnson's entire strategy after the war for his to building his own political power because that's what he wanted to do. Like Tyler wanted after the death of William Henry Harrison, Ty, John Tyler, who was a Democrat who had no connection to the Whig program, was motivated by a desire to build an independent political base, basically among Southern slave owners. Johnson was trying to sort of do a post-war version of that, which was to raise up the white yeomanry who he felt that he represented. Once again, not out of solidarity, but simple identification. He was one. They were him. It was just it's selfish uh, narcissism. It's not really a political vision. Uh, by restoring power to the planter elite at the expense of the ex-slaves. Now that was doomed. It could not have worked. And we see the result. The result is the restoration of power to the fancy lads who he hated and the continued immiseration of poor whites. Because white poverty did not was not alleviated by reconstruction it was only deepened and extended so his even his uh if you want the most altruistic reading the most politically sophisticated uh reading of his desire of his mo motivation to lift up the white po the poor whites of the south was doomed from the beginning and failed miserably jackson was based during nullification it's the same thing johnson had the exact same politics as jackson which was wild racism desire for manifest destiny inveterate hostility to Eastern finance 
and the federal government, but a maniacal obsession with the notion of the Union as indivisible. That's it. So as soon as so when the planters were reinstated in power, they of course reharnessed the yeoman to their thing, to their rule. They they uh the only force that was trying to allow any upward mobility for poor whites in the South was the Freedmen's Bureau. By and and the Reconstruction governments that came later, which tried to do things like create public fucking school systems, which had never existed in the South. Because I'm not paying for it. Why should I pay for it? My fancy child has a bunch of French tutors come to him. Why would I pay for some grubby white trash to get an education? There, the the uh, the uh, poverty of the of of the white South was entrenched by planter rule, and it was perpetuated by the continuation of planter rule after the war. The only thing that could have broken planter power, which he which Johnson claimed to hate, was a political uh, a political union, a political coordination between the poor whites and the ex-slaves. It's the only thing that could have done it. But Johnson was completely blinded by his fanatical racism. And honestly, the people who say, oh, Lincoln was racist too, you, you can only think that if you live in the fantasy land of now, where racism is like uh, some sort of soul particulate, where you are either completely washed clean of it because you've uh, seen enough of those Instagram fucking uh, infographics to be purified of racism, or it's all-consuming. Uh, I mean, Lincoln met, just as like a, a very superficial example, Lincoln met uh, with a number of black people over the course of his presidency in the White House, talked to them. Uh, uh, Frederick Douglass said, I talked to the man. He did not give, he did not give me any reason to believe that he didn't think me an equal to him. Andrew Johnson refused to meet Frederick Douglass. He would fucking shoo, him off, shoo black people off of the front porch. He was viscerally racist in a way that Lincoln simply was not. And that fucking matters. When you're the president, and because of the idiocy of our Constitution, you have sole control over the reorganization of an entire fucking chunk of the country for upwards of a year. So... What was presidential reconstruction, which he tried to put off to create this new uh, political uh, coalition of the white yeomen, the white, the former planters, and northern republic, northern Democrats, in order to sustain his power and give him a real term, because that's the same, that's the thing that unified him and John Tyler, the desire to get a term of their own, because it doesn't really count if you were vice president, and the guy before you died. You gotta get. You gotta be elected on your own terms, which is what they both drove their entire uh, presidencies towards, and both foundered m miserably because neither one of them understood the actual terrain of politics because they had their heads up their fucking asses. So the policies were restoring all the land to the former slave owners, which is obscene and and makes no sense morally, legally, as I pointed out, as a as a former slave pointed out in a section from last week. If you've got the fucking right to take the slaves, you have the right to take the land, obviously. But also to restore political rights to the rebels. Uh, and the motivator for that was an insane piece of reasoning that Lincoln was, Johnson was completely fixated on. He was so... Uh, he was so... Uh, opposed to the notion of secession. He was so opposed to the idea that you could secede. The idea that secession was allowed by the Constitution. That he asserted that because secession is not possible, then the states never really seceded, which means there needs to be no reorganization and readmission to the Union because they never left. Which is a perfect logic guy Reddit approach to reality. You have this logical uh, syllogism in your head that's completely airtight according to you and it has nothing to do with the reality on the ground somebody uh some uh, Foner points out someone at the time said like his th thinking about secession is like saying because you're not allowed to murder people that means no one's ever committed murder and so why would you punish someone for murder you can't murder people like they fucking did it they had their own country for four years they shot a bunch of our guys So because of that, 
he issued a blanket amnesty to former Confederates, allowed basically everybody who fought with the Confederacy back into public service. And this was incredibly important because no one, because political power in the 19th century was powered by patronage, the ability to appoint people to, to uh, public offices. And the people who Johnson allowed to take power in these Southern states had the ability to fill basically the entire ranks of the civic service in all these states unprecedented patronage power. The kind of patronage power that a different president could have used to suborn uh, ascension to, say, black uh, citizenship and uh, and uh, land redistribution. Like, hey, all you poor whites, I know you're mad about black people uh, having land and being able to vote, but who wants to be a fucking postal clerk? Who wants, who wants to be a justice of the peace? That could have been used. Instead, those ranks were filled up immediately with former Confederates. He had an exemption for anybody who owned $20,000 or more worth of property, but as I said, you could get a pardon if you asked nicely, if you sent him a letter and asked. And I gotta believe that a part of the reason he did that, this resent-driven freak, was that he loved the idea of, of the former Taylor, the rough-hewn boy from Tennessee, getting all of these begging letters from all these lavender-scented fops. And then he's like, yeah, yeah. But he fucking signed off on these things by the rafter, hundreds a day in some cases, which meant that uh, the former Confederates, uh, people who took arms against the country at the highest levels, were back in government very quickly. Uh, and the very high levels, though, were either it was taking too long for them to get their uh, their pardons, or they were they refused to cooperate with the Yankees. So the people who ended up taking power in these new states were a mixture of uh, the kind of upcountry uh, poor whites that he was, uh, who were hostile to uh, planter power and had been hostile to planter power before the war. Uh, it has to be remembered that the southern states, as much as we like to think that they were bastions of liberty for white people, had wildly undemocratic voting structures. In fact, there were property requirements, not just for voting in some states, but for, uh, but for and then after property requirements for voting went away over time, but in many of the Southern states, property requirements to serve in uh, government were still in effect and were reasserted after the war by some of these fancy lands. So the people who were opposed to that, they were, they were enthralled in places where there was significant anti-Confederate uh, unionist sympathy before the war, places like North Carolina and Arkansas, places with mountains, basically places without mountains though, uh, the only real union people, people who were opposed to secession in 1860, but then probably ended up joining the Confederacy anyway, because, hey, that's what the state's doing, uh, were ex-Whigs. Uh, Whigs uh, made up a, a, a significant percentage of the, the very high points of the planter elite in the South, the ones who were most connected to finance, the ones who were most hostile to even white democracy, and they were the ones who took power in a number of these other states. Um, And with this coalition, Johnson hoped to put the war basically behind everybody. Hey, let's bygones be bygones. And they were going to put it all on the backs of the former slaves. And what was going to motivate that in part was uh, white yeoman hostility to the blacks, which was generated by a very weird belief that a lot of them had, uh, that it was that slavery was, if, was n black people's fault an equal, if not greater, amounts than it was their owners. That they had a love for their owners and that they actually really only hated free whites. Now that, of course, is classic projection because for a poor white, uh, their social condition is precarious and the, the one thing that keeps them on this side of the, the social uh, fabric is that they're not black. And so that means that Hatred and hostility uh, is all generated on those closest to them in condition, which was, they were much closer in the condition of their life. Like day to day, uh, obviously they had a great degree of freedom that blacks didn't, but in terms of the conditions of their housing, the conditions of their labor, they were much closer to slaves than they were to slave owners. And so, of course, the familiarity is what breeds the contempt. Uh, and that was something that Johnson felt and something that he hoped could he could cultivate and give him a new basis for political power. And it might have it might have worked, except for the fact 
that these new uh, governments refuse to take yes for an answer, refuse to take the offer of, look, acknowledge the end of slavery and basic civic freedom, not even asking for something like uh, um, uh, suffrage, and then we can kind of move on. And uh, they all said, fuck you. <laughs> and what they did was pass a bunch of insanely draconian laws uh, uh, restricting the freedom of ex-slaves, called black codes, restricted their ability to move without, uh, without permission, the uh, basically making it illegal for them to not sign employment contracts every year, to be unemployed, uh, and uh, made it illegal for them to congregate anywhere in public and certainly in cities, and liable for arrest and, and uh, transmission to forced labor if they were found away from a plantation. Essentially what they tried to do was take the private regime of, of coercion that had existed under slavery and make it the duty of the state. But the North, that was a bridge too far. Even though there was no great commitment to black equality, certainly black suffrage in the North. In fact, a number of uh, referenda about allowing blacks to vote in Northern states were, was, were uh, defeated in 1865. Uh, this was just a bridge too far because the war, the sacrifices of the war, which had been incalculable in the north maybe the, the the land had prospered but the people had died in large numbers had seen their friends and family go off and never come back it had to mean something it had to fucking mean something and the idea that the people who seceded from the union killed a bunch of their friends and family fathers and brothers would go back in power and essentially recreate slavery with a different, with extra steps, as they said on Rick and Morty, was just too fucking much. And it created a backlash to Johnson and to presidential reconstruction, which many Northerners supported in the very beginning of his uh, administration, that would culminate in the uh, creation of radical reconstruction. And I think the fact that you have this political will here to push beyond the status quo ante in the name really of black freedom, a, a push that would lead to the establishment within a few years of something that nobody really was taking seriously as an idea, North or South, in 1865, uh, 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 black voting rights to occur and for civil rights to be enacted. That, to me, indicates that there was some political base for a project that would have been centered on black uh, re redistribution of plantation land to slaves that could very well have been uh, affirmed and channeled and shaped by a Lincoln administration. It would have led to a greater degree of conflict with the ex-planters, uh, which very well would have come to violence. But it came to violence anyway. And the question is, maybe it would have come to more productive violence. And so next week, I don't know if it's going to be Wednesday. It might be Thursday. Uh, I will figure it out and let everyone know. But there will be a stream next week. I don't think there's going to be a stream tomorrow I'll, or uh, Friday. I will uh, let everyone know on that. Uh, still up in the air. But sometime next week, there will be another stream where we talk about five uh, chapters... Uh, Chapters six and seven, yeah, which will be which will start when Congress finally reconvenes in December of 1866 with a strong Republican majorities in both houses, with a invigorated radical faction willing to confront the president, and uh, all of a sudden a lot of things that didn't seem possible and seemed like lights that were dimming out of existence uh, uh, in the summer of 1866 five are starting to fl flame back up again and as i said that's why uh that's why i think this is worth looking at um 
because it didn't have to be this way, I don't think. And if it didn't have to be this way then, then nothing has to be anyway. So there's fluidity, there's chance. There are things beyond the dry workings of the market determining human actions and human hearts. So we'll talk about that next week. Very frustrating reading this week. I'm sure everybody reading, especially the chapter on Johnson, was just gnawing on their fucking hands the whole time. I know I was. Just want to hit him with a brick. Uh, but it'll be fun to watch him get his shit owned in the next chapter. Because uh, he did not take the emergence of a, a congressional consensus on Reconstruction very well. He essentially pulled a Trump in that he tried to rally support for his vision of Reconstruction by a whistle-stop tour of northern cities. Uh, but in the more rough-and-tumble, less security-fixated uh, world of those politics, he got his shit, uh, he got his shit booed out of town. He got, uh, he got jeered, he got, he got whistled at. It's pretty funny. Uh, and he was drunk most of the time. Uh, so we'll talk about that next week. Got a few minutes here if anyone has any questions. Anybody has any specific questions about what we've read? But yeah, no, Johnson's worst president of all time. Nobody else had the position that they were in to dictate things because plenty of presidents were monsters, but they were monsters who essentially embodied a moment of time rather than shaped it. And I think that is the reality of the American presidency. And why ranking them by goodness or badness is often so arbitrary and beside the point. It really isn't like ranking baseball players. It's like ranking umpires. A president's ability to do good or evil is essentially the luck of where they find themselves in time and their willingness to embody historical forces beyond their uh, control. But there are a few hinge points where individual uh, decision-making really is fundamental to outcomes, to destiny. And Johnson is one of them. Someone says even Buchanan. Yes! The, the situation among the doe faces who occupied the presidency before the Civil War was essentially untenable. They were trying to hold together a consensus that was breaking apart in front of them. And they had no idea. They were not equipped uh, ideologically, uh, politically, intellectually to deal with it. If you flip James Buchanan and Franklin Pierce, you have basically the same outcome, I believe. I mean, fucking Franklin Pierce... Uh, Franklin Pierce supported the Confederacy. The motherfucker was from fucking New Hampshire. Uh, they're, they would have just done the same things in that moment. They, would, they, they had no wherewithal to resist secession. They would have facilitated it. Because facilitating the slave power was all the Northern Democrats knew how to do. It was the sine qua non of power. It was how you got the big chair. was by kissing the ass of the South. They didn't, didn't know, know what else to do. So they all would have done it. Johnson, they were destroyed. They were destroyed and defeated people. And he picked them back up, dusted them off, and put them back in charge. When it didn't have to happen. It's Johnson. There's no question. Yeah, Pierce was a big alcoholic. It might have had something to do with the fact that all of his kids kept dying. Even to this day, a lot of the president's decisions are on rails. I would argue more than ever. I think one of the reasons that we now have these presidents who seem to only exist to be seen in power and only pursue power for like a narcissistic desire to be seen is because they all know at a certain level that they don't have any real power or authority to do anything. Like Obama, I think, intellectually understands that. I think Trump just does it more viscerally. But both of them watched themselves be president. I mean, uh, Obama was like writing his memoirs while he was president. Like that was the whole point of it, was to have memoirs, to have Netflix deals, to have a podcast where he can pontificate upon power. Not to actually ever be in the room where power is exercised. Fucking uh, 
Trump just tweeted his way, watched TV and tweeted himself through the presidency. Both of them aware at a certain level that they actually were not the ones who uh, called the shots. And now we got a guy who literally doesn't even know where he is, who just wants to be president because it's all he's ever wanted. And he doesn't even know why anymore. That's it. The guy had two brain hemorrhages when he ran for president 30 years ago. His life flashed before his eyes. All the things that happened to him happened in a moment. And all it did was further solidify in his freak brain that being president was the only thing that mattered. Because it was the only thing, I think, that could have validated all the horrors of his life, all the awfulness of his existence, is if he gets to be president. And now he's done it. And that's it. He gets to wander around the White House, not even knowing what day it is. Half the time, he probably doesn't even know he's president. That's the hilarious part of it. He probably sits around, he's probably waiting for Barack to show up. All right. That was good. I thought we, 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 we did well on that. Next week. Maybe on Friday, I'll let you know. But next week, definitely, we'll talk chapters uh, six and seven.